you're trying to use history to teach moral lessons, then you can't view it as a kind of very, very dark comedy, which I think in essence it is. You know, a comedy in the sense that Dante used the word comedy, i.e. containing scope for multitudes of horrors. and But that ultimately, I don't think that history embodies a sense of moral progress. I don't think that there are right sides of history. I don't think that the arc of history bends towards justice. Looking for moral lessons from history is itself faintly, darkly comic. Hello and welcome to this week's pod and I finally managed to publish my chat with Tom Holland. He needs no introduction but here goes. He's the best-selling historian of a trilogy of books on ancient Rome, Rubicon, Dynasty and now his latest Pax. Of course he's also one half of the podcast phenomenon The Rest is History with Dominic Sandbrook. Tom joined me to talk about Pax which covers the reign of Nero all the way to the Emperor Hadrian. So we talk sex, the Greeks and Rome emperors of Rome, and then we go on to talk about Tom's view of history, as you heard at the top there, as well as a few other questions from readers and listeners, and I even managed to get the recent Ashes series controversy in, when England's Johnny Bairstow was stumped by the Australian wicketkeeper, and I asked Tom what the Romans would have thought of that. Plenty more great history to come, including part two of my special on the Parthenon marbles, when I get the other view in favour of retention in the British Museum, and Gordon Corrigan returns to discuss our Hundred Years' War series and the Battle of Poitiers. Please do share with friends and rate and review if you can. But in the meantime, I'll hand you over to me talking with Tom Holland on Ancient Rome. Tom, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. It's it's a real pleasure to have you on. And I'm talking to you about your, your latest book, Pax. Uh, yes. So thank you very much for having me. And, and hello to everyone. So, um, so it's. It, I think it's been about twenty years since you wrote Rubicon, and I was thinking about this when I was reading your introduction because it struck me during your introduction. You you mentioned at one point, I think, and I'm paraphrasing. I'm not do, using a direct quote, but you say something along the lines of, "You're going to take the Romans as they were, not and try not to impose current yep. values." And I wondered, in the writing of history, in the twenty years since you wrote Rubicon. Do you think the writing of history itself has changed during that time? And I guess what I'm getting at is uh, there tends to be a, a, some historians who do like to apply values of the present. To the well, it, it reflects the fact that over the course of, of the 20 years, as you say, that since I wrote Rubicon, which is the first of, of what is now a series of three books on the history of the Roman Empire, I've been on a journey, as, as I think you should. I mean, you know, that's the whole point of, of writing in a way is to... Is you don't want to be in the same rut all the time. When I wrote Rubicon, I pitched it to publishers as being a, a mirror held up to, to the present. So I would have used Barbara Tuckman's uh, evocative title, A Distant Mirror, if that had been available. This idea that, that in this um, the, the age of the Roman Republic, this imperial republic with all kinds of military and economic and vested interests in, in the Near East, there was perhaps that there were echoes that could be found of the America of, of George Bush. So I was writing Rubicon during 9-11 and in the immediate aftermath. And actually, I was writing this um, about Mithridates, the king of Pontus, who launches a wholesale massacre of Roman and Italian businessmen on a single day when 9-11 happened. So the sense that there were echoes there was very strong with me. And I consciously wove that into the writing of Rubicon. So there are, one of the chapter title is uh, War on Terror. Another one is Known Unknowns. It wasn't that I was kind of hiding from that. But one of the things that kind of struck me while I was writing Rubicon was that actually that sense of a parallel, that sense of a mirror could hugely be overdone because the, the, the prevailing thing that I took from immersing myself in the Roman world, trying to see the world through Roman eyes, which was the first time I'd done it on a kind of concentrated uh, way, brought home to me how a lot of things that seemed recognizable and familiar only served to heighten all the things that weren't. And that was 
an understanding of the classical past that was sharpened for me with each successive book about the period that I wrote. So when I came to write Pax, you know, I I I would kind of recently I've I've had various commissions from editors, and they say, yeah, we'd love to have you write a piece about the parallels between you know the age of Hadrian and and, and our own world, and actually. I don't want to talk about the parallels because I think the parallels are, are very dim and distant. I think what is fascinating actually is just how completely different the Romans were to us. And I think we delude ourselves. And maybe I was being a bit deluded when I began Rubicon. I mean, I hope that that was something that I kind of worked out of my system as I wrote it. But it's definitely an understanding of the Roman past that is much sharper for me now. It's just how strange it was. And so when I wrote this, I wanted to convey a sense of that. I wanted people, in a sense, to, to enter a world in which the whole point is how strange it is. That's the fascination of it. And hopefully, the book enables you to come to understand the Romans as they see themselves. Their, 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 their morality is, by our lights, often terrifying, alien. It can often barely seem moral at all. And yet, I think it is moral. And I hope that by the end, you, you recognize and accept that. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I always thought that studying ancient history, how alien they really are to me. Um, that's 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 the fascination of it. But one area that I I find them almost so strange is the attitude to sex, yes. which yeah, it's 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 endlessly enjoyable to talk about uh, sex, gender. Um, their 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 attitudes are just so strange. I mean, in particular, a key uh, character throughout the early part of the book is Popolea, who is, well, it's rather a horrible story, really. Um, but I but I suppose that's to me. To the Romans, it, it, it wasn't. I think it is to the Romans as well, actually. Uh, and that's why it's remembered. So this is Popeia Sabina, who uh, comes in two incarnations in the book. So uh, it opens with her funeral, and she is the wife of Nero, the emperor, the last of the bloodline of Augustus. Uh, much beloved by her. She's the most fashionable woman in Rome. She has her own brand of cosmetics. She's supposed to bathe herself in, in uh, ass's milk. So it's her rather than Cleopatra that that story is originally told. Or, um, and the, the dark rumor is that she is pregnant with Nero's child, he comes back late from the races. She nags him about this and he kicks her in the stomach and she and the baby die. We have no way of knowing if the story is true. The fact that it's told of him uh, tells you something about the um, the negative attitudes that uh, Nero has provoked, certainly among the kind of elite figures who are writing the histories in this period. Um, but what's not in doubt is the titanic scale of Nero's grief. And that may reflect um, simple bereavement or it may be intermingled with guilt. Ultimately, we can't possibly know the answer to that. But his, he gives her a state funeral in the forum and then he embalms her and places her in the, the mausoleum of Augustus. And he then goes on to marry another woman who is rather like Papaya. She's aristocratic. She is highly intelligent. She's glamorous. This is clearly the kind of woman that Nero likes. Um, the only drawback to this um, this this next wife that Nero has married is that she doesn't look like Papaya, and Nero is desperate for to sleep with someone who looks like Papaya, so he scouts around and and puts out you know his agents to find someone who looks like her, and the person that they find is not a girl but a boy, and this poor boy is castrated, and tutored, and dressed up and painted to look exactly like Papaya. And from that point on, Nero treats her as Papaya. She goes around in litter. She you know, dresses in Papaya's robes and her jewels. And when Nero in due course commits suicide, he, he, he loses the support of the provinces. He despairs. Um, and with him, the last of the, uh, the bloodline of Augustus goes. And so the huge question that is now facing the Roman world is, well, who's going to succeed him? There is in Rome the commander of the Praetorians, the, the the palace guard. He goes and grabs this poor boy, who nickname who who Nero had nicknamed Sporus, which in Greek means spunk. He he grabs him, her, takes him as his concubine, um, and in a sense is laying claim to to the Neronian legacy. To sleep with someone who slept with Nero is, of course, a great thing for anyone to do. 
the, the, the Praetorian captain is removed fairly quickly. And the guy who, ha, who, who seizes control as emperor is a man called Galba, who has been um, the leading figure in Spain. He has legions and he has various officials behind him. He marches on Rome, enters Rome, establishes himself as the new emperor and is a, a, a self-consciously backward looking traditionalist reactionary even one might say he wants to see the roman people restored to how they were back in the early days of the republic when they just ate turnips and you know sat around being virtuous that's his ideal and so he's very much not the kind of guy who would um go to go to bed with a a maimed boy who's been made to look like nero's wife but he gets toppled pretty quickly uh, and part of why he doesn't have mass support is that actually the Romans don't want this kind of reactionary They've moved on. conservatism. They have so moved on. And and uh, Galba is bald and he's disapproving and he's finger wagging and he's a massive bore and they don't like him. And the guy who topples him is not just an old friend, an old mucker of Nero's, but had actually been Papea's husband. And the story of how Papea moves on from this guy to become Nero's wife is very complicated. There are various accounts of it. Was there a menage a trois? You know, was was Papea being groomed or whatever? But this guy, Otho, once Nero has taken over his wife, poor old Otho gets dispatched to govern Lusitania, Portugal. And that's why he's in situ in Iberia to, to, to give his backing to Galba. So Otho comes with um, Galba to Rome, assuming that he is going to be adopted by Galba and therefore become um, Galba's heir and in due course become Caesar himself. But Galba doesn't go for Otho, uh, doesn't really approve of him, sees Otho as basically being too Neronian. And that's not simply because um, he uh, Otho had slept with Papaya Sabina. It's also because he does all kinds of un-Republican things like wearing a toupee, like depilating himself. You know, he's kind of very sm literally smooth guy, smooth operator. Um, and so when Galba gets killed and um, Otho takes over, he has no hesitation in laying his hands on poor Sporus, poor Papaya Sabina, because for, for, for Otho, as for Nero, there's a kind of, there's clearly a massive frisson in taking this person who looks like his dead wife to bed with him. Now, this makes Otho sound very sinister um, and lightweight figure. Actually, he turns out to be rather impressive. He has a, a, an impressive death because meanwhile, up on the, the Rhine, where there is the largest concentration of military power in the whole empire, huge number of legions, these legions mutiny and they, uh, they kind of bully the commander of the lower reaches of the Rhine to, 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 to claim the, the rule of the world. He doesn't really want to. This is a guy called Vitellius, who is notorious for his pie consumption. He's a very large guy. And the, the, his legions meet with Otho's. Otho, Otho's legions lose. It's not terminal for Otho, but he decides that it's poor form to carry on fighting a civil war, that this will spell too much doom for the Romans. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't want to see this. So he commits suicide. So he perishes very nobly and heroically. Vitellius moves on, he comes, he occupies Rome. And of course, there's the question of what to do about this poor Sporus, Papaya Sabina. And Vitellius, as well as Otho, had been a friend of Nero's. You know, he, 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 he is, had been part of Nero's set. So there might have been scope for him to take over Papaya Sabina, Sporus. But he decides by this point that, that Sporus is used goods. You know, it, he's been around too many people. Yeah. And so he decides, Vitellius decides that he is going to please the masses. He's going to play the populist card. He's going to show what a good guy he is by giving the people of Rome a spectacle that they will never forget. And this spectacle is that Sporus, Papaya Sabina, will be dressed up as Proserpina, the daughter of Ceres, the, the goddess of harvest, who had been abducted by Pluto, the god of the underworld, taken down into Hades where, where she rules as his queen. And he decides he's going to dress Sporus up as Proserpina. He's going to have a whole load of gladiators who will be dressed up as Pluto and that, that Sporus will be gang raped to death by these gladiators. And Sporus decides that he's had enough at this point and kills himself. 
And that is a terrible, terrible story. And I think that it, it's remembered and commemorated because the Romans themselves thought, actually, that's a pretty, you know, that's pretty harsh. But having said that, I think it is also remembered because Nero, one of the reasons he gets toppled is that he, he pushes things to extremes that offend the traditional elites. But at the same time, his pushing of things to extremes does make him kind of admired does make him fated by the masses so there is this kind of this this ambivalent attitude towards him and to stunts like what he does to sporus that is a crucial part of understanding you know the, the character of roman culture there isn't one absolute morality as in our society so in roman society there are different shades of opinion there are conservative takes there are kind of more radical takes there as uh, highbrow takes there are populist takes it's all part of a continuum and I, I very very much wanted to convey the sense of the tensions and ambivalences that are the fruit of that of that continuum so i suppose there's an assumption that the masses think in one way which of course they don't and and i guess that's yeah. that's the... there is no one roman attitude you can't say yeah. the romans thought this i mean you can say that there are you know there's an overton window in I don't know what you'd call it maybe the Pompeii window I mean who knows but there isn't one way of seeing the world you know it's complex which well, is I was interested... so fascinating yeah absolutely I mean th th I guess slightly related to that I was interested in how the Greeks viewed the Romans at this at this time I mean there's a there's a hilarious quote from Juvenal in the book um, which is the Roman view of Greeks is that they have a, a quick wit shameless nerve a fluency readier than that of a trained orator. So there's a sort of, there is a sort of a sneaking admiration for the Greeks. But what was the Greek view of the Romans during this period? Did they obviously it had been many years since they had supremacy? Well, Nero had adored the Greeks, so he 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 went with Sporus, Papaea Sabina, on a tour of Greece, where he notoriously he he wins the chariot race at the Olympic Games, and Nero grants. But the entire province of Greece, a tax exemption. So the Greeks obviously love him. And when Nero kills himself, all kinds of fake Neros pop up all over the place, um, claiming to be Nero. What happens in the year that follows Nero's death, AD 69, remembered by the Romans as the year of the four emperors. So we've already had um, Galba, we've had Otho, we've had Vitellius. At the end of that year, Vitellius too is toppled and replaced as emperor by a man called Vespasian. And Vespasian is a rugged soldier. He comes from a, a peasant background in the, the fields and hills beyond Rome. Um, it's said of him that he looks like a man who's always straining for a shit. And Vespasian is, he's not the kind of guy who's particularly keen on Greeks. You know, he's, he's a much more, you know, much kind of traditional uh, attitude towards them. And so he revokes the Greeks tax exemption status. You know, he says that they're too servile to, merit freedom and so you know that provokes resentment on the part of the greeks but again there are many different ways and you know it depends on your class it depends on your your status it depends where you are geographically i think under vespasian and his heirs so vespasian belongs to a family called the flavian so under the flavian emperors there's a kind of quiet tolerance of roman rule no one is going to rebel against them i mean there's no question of that and you get philosophers who are essentially offering themselves up as kind of gurus to to leading Romans, including emperors. But then when you get into the age of, of Trajan and Hadrian, particularly Hadrian, which is the, the, the early decades of the second century AD, I think you start to see kind of generational changes because on the part of the Romans and particularly Hadrian, you get a willingness to see certainly the, the Greek aristocracies as potentially being Roman. So these are people who, whereas in previous generations, there wouldn't have been any prospect of them joining the Senate, let alone becoming consul, which is the highest office in, in Rome. By the time of, of Trajan and, and Hadrian, that is becoming a possibility. And so there are Greek aristocrats who, rather than following the specifically Greek roots to prominence, whether that be studying philosophy or you know, leading a town council or whatever, you can aim much higher. You can, you can become a... a, a a Roman in Rome and win Roman offices, go off and govern provinces, all kinds of things like that. And that opens up a world in which it's possible for Greeks to be both, to be Greco-Roman or Romano-Greek. 
And the paradigmatic writer of this age is, is a man who actually I don't really overtly mention in Pax, although his spirit is there a good deal. And that's Plutarch, who writes a famous series of paired biographies, famous Greeks, famous Romans. So he pairs, say, Alexander the Great with Julius Caesar. And it's here that you can see the future of the Roman world, because what we're seeing in the age of Hadrian is a sense that you can be simultaneously a Greek speaker and identify as Roman that will culminate a, a thousand years and more in the future with the, the focus of Roman rule lying in the Greek world. And in due course, in 1453, the last capital of the Roman Empire, when it falls, it's Greek speakers. It's a Greek speaking city, Constantinople, that will succumb to the Turks. Right. So it's during your book, you know, well, during this time, that's when we get the blending of the two, the worlds. I think you were, you were, I think the blending has been happening a good deal. Uh, it's been happening on the elite level and it's also been happening um, lower down more brutally. Well, I'll come to that in a minute, but I, I think that it is in the time of Hadrian who, who as a boy was called Griculus, the little Greek, that you see a Caesar consciously and enthusiastically sponsoring a sense among the Greeks that they can have a, a Greek identity that is not opposed to Roman identity, but can go with the grain. So up to now, I've been talking about the elites. What about people much lower down? Now, one of the fruits of conquest back in the age of, of the Republic, the, the second and, and first centuries BC, when Roman armies are conquering the eastern half of the Mediterranean, Greek-speaking empires, is a vast influx of slaves. The Romans reap an enormous harvest of human property. And these, these people are brought back to Italy. Many of them toil in the fields, they toil in the mines, but not all of them by any means. A huge proportion um, live in the cities and the towns of Italy. And whether they are domestic slaves or whether they are publicly owned slaves by the various city councils, um, the likelihood is that most of these will be freed. And as freedmen, they will have a kind of the servile taint it will be seen as something that can't be eradicated in the space of a generation. But over the course of the generations, those slaves become Italian, become Roman. And this is a process that is ongoing throughout the first and second centuries AD. So that also is, you know, is offering a sense of a world in which identity is an incredibly fluid thing. And there's a capaciousness to what is meant by Roman that in the, uh, the long run, again, will culminate in what happens at the beginning of the third century AD when the emperor Caracalla proclaims that every free male within the limits of the Roman world can have the gift of citizenship. So this is a, absolutely an ongoing process. So in that sense, I think you can see, I mean, this may sound shocking to people, but you could see, say, domestic servitude, being a slave in the household of a Roman citizen as kind of the process by which you earn your green card. It's a way in which, you know, you could have decades and decades of exploitation, sexual abuse, whatever. But at the end of it, you might be, you'd be given the freedom that in the long run will enable your descendants to attain citizenship. Alongside those Greek slaves, then, you would have had British slaves. Actually, British is the wrong word. Um, yeah, you slaves. could call them British, I think. Yeah, you could call them British. Yeah, so there's very much a sense... Uh, I, you're not going to teach your children. Uh, Brit uh, Britain no. will not teach your kids. No. You'll be carrying the wood or, or that sort Absolutely. Of they will be domestic. They will be field workers or might be working in the mines because they're, you know, they're thuggish and stupid and they don't know how to construe a poem. Absolutely. The Roman economy in this period is highly advanced. Uh, so I quote the... Um, it's extraordinary, of, uh, actually. Yeah. Professor of economics at uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the in the introduction where he says, and I'm, I'm not an economist, so I'm not really qualified to, to evaluate the arguments that enables leads him to this conclusion. But he says that uh, essentially the Roman world in this period is more advanced than anywhere and any time prior to the emergence of modern capitalism in the Dutch Republic and England in the 17th century, which is kind of amazing. But when you look at the sophistication of the markets in the Roman world. You can see why he would come to this conclusion. And the slavery market is a, is a brilliant example of this, that, you know, the import business, people, the human property being brought to Rome is extremely efficient. 
there are highly specialized markets. So yes, absolutely. If you want to come and buy some field laborers, then you would get Britons. If you want a tutor for your son, then you would get a Greek and there would be markets that would supply these. You know, they would source the, 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 the requisite human livestock and then they would sell them on. And it's a mark of, I think, both how, again, coming back to the sense in which the echoes of the present us are massively distorted by what makes them alien is that you do have at the top end, you have luxury products that such as we might recognize in, you know, Bond Street or whatever, absolutely kind of top end shopping areas. And in these shopping, top end shopping areas, you might be able to go and buy a dwarf or a child with a tiny head. And these would have been um, children would have been bought when they were young and kept in cages to stump their growth or their heads would have been molded to give them a distorted form. Uh, and on the one hand, you might think, well, this is capitalism. And on the other hand, you might think that is hideous beyond my ability to comprehend how people could do this. And, and you know, that's what is both simultaneously fascinating and terrifying about the Romans, I think. They yeah. are, they, they may, if, if they are like us, then the ways in which they are not like us really destabilizes a sense that, uh, that that there is any real continuities yeah yeah although I, I was just listening to your episodes on oppenheimer and they didn't come close to um destroying the entire planet i guess there's that no but um you know so the what is at stake for the romans in the era of the four emperors ad ad 69 is a sense that the roman world roman order is equivalent to civilization and that the great task of the Romans has been to not just to, to tame the world militarily, but to do it physically, to construct fields uh, out of mud, to, to build roads where there had been only forests and wilderness, to fashion baths and central heating where there had been only kind of dung heaps. This, this is a, an important sense of how the Romans understand their, their mission, their God-given mission, as they see it, to, 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 to bring order to the world. And so when that Roman order collapses in the year AD 69, there is anxiety on the part of many, many people, provincials as well as Romans, that this betokens the end of the world, that the gods have given up on the world and that all will be anarchy and darkness. And even when peace is restored to the Roman world by Vespasian, it's not immediately clear to people that they're out of the woods. So the, the greatest temple in Rome, the, the temple to Jupiter, had been destroyed in the street fighting that had accompanied the overthrow of Vitellius at the end of 69. Vespasian sets to rebuilding it, but it burns down again within a decade. Uh, there is also a terrible plague and you know, from the, the time of, of the Iliad onwards, people have always associated plague with the wrath of the gods. And then this sense that the fruits of civilization can be blotted out, that darkness can rule where there had been light, is given a vivid literal demonstration by this terrible eruption of Vesuvius that occurs in AD 69. So a year off, a decade after the, the year of the four emperors, when darkness literally descends on the Bay of Naples, which is the most prosperous, the most affluent in so many ways, the, the most advanced and developed region of the whole Roman Empire. And Although they do seem to be the, um, the Millwall of the, uh, of the Roman. Well, Pompeii yeah. is. Pompeii, yeah, I say Pompeii. So Pompeii, Pompeii and Herculaneum famously are completely obliterated. Pompeii is a slightly more provincial town than, say, Naples, which is you know, the, the, the Monte Carlo of, uh, of the Roman world, you Putioli, which is the great port. Uh, it's, it's the nerve center of the entire Roman economy, really the, 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 the harbor that receives the grain ships that enables Rome to be fed, uh, Mycenae, which is where the Roman fleet is based. So the fact that this has been engulfed by ash and smoke again is, is devastating. And I think that there is a kind of anxiety in the wake of all these catastrophes and, and calamities among the Romans that they are staring down the barrel of, of a, an apocalypse 
I mean, it's not equivalent to the dread of nuclear war, but I think it is a really palpable dread that perhaps the gods have withdrawn their favor. And I think that this is what explains the policies of an emperor who is commemorated by his successors in very, very negative terms as as a a tyrant, um, as as a a, a human monster. This is the emperor Domitian, who's the the younger son of Vespasian. His elder brother Titus had been emperor during the the eruption of Vesuvius. Uh, But Domitian rules for much longer than Titus, who only ruled for two years. And I think that he is massively influenced by the dread that the world, the Roman world, is threatened by implosion and collapse. And everything he does has essentially as its aim an attempt to please the gods. So it's a kind of, you know, we're tempted to park this and think, oh, this is the dimension of religion and superstition. It's nothing to do with real things like the functioning of the economy or whatever. But I think that's completely wrong. I think this is as fundamental to Domitian as the attempt to stop nuclear war is to, say, the Americans or the Soviets during the Cold War. It's it's a really, really pr- pressing responsibility. And because the Romans don't separate out the dimension of the gods and the dimension of the mortal, they don't have a concept of the secular, everything that Domitian does is bound up with his attempt to propitiate the gods, whether it's regulating the currency, whether it's regulating the frontiers, whatever. If we look at some of the successful emperors during this time, though, I mean, certainly seem to be respected by the masses. They tend to be sort of successful military leaders, don't they? I mean, yeah. Vespasian, Trajan, Hadrian, they're all they're all sort of grounded in military achievement. Is is Does that then become the sem- template for success as an emperor, whereas before it wasn't so necessary? I think it had always been a template for being an imperator because imperator originally meant a successful general. Uh, Caesar had been an imperator. Augustus had been an imperator. Over the course of um, the Julia Claudian period, so the the period where uh, Augustus's heirs are ruling the world, imperator comes to take on the meaning that our English word emperor, which derives from it, would have. But that sense that an emperor is also an imperator, as in a general, never goes. And it's what enables Vespasian actually to be such a successful ruler, because even though he's come from this kind of relatively unsophisticated background, he's a very successful general. He's the man who had suppressed the revolt in Judea. Titus, his son, had actually terminated that revolt, had captured Jerusalem, had destroyed the temple, had stripped it bare. They share a joint triumph, so a parade through the streets of Rome. And so both Vespasian and Titus can brand themselves as imperatores. Domitian in due course can as well, because he leads campaigns um, both on the Rhine and the Danube. And that is, I think, very much an important part of, of the imperatorial image. And Trajan is commemorated as the best of, em- uh, best of emperors. Um, he's the Optimus Princeps. Because he offers to the Romans a reassurance that they can essentially have their cake and eat it, that they haven't been softened by the fruits of empire, that they can continue this mission to to conquer the world, that they have the kind of the manliness and the fortitude and the heroism of their ancestors. But at the same time, they can enjoy all the fruits of these conquests. And that's why everyone adores Trajan, is that he is a proper old fashioned imperator, a man who conquers a vast swathe of territory, plunders its wealth, but he's then doing what Augustus had done and what Caesar's properly should do in the opinion of the Roman people, which is to lavish them with massive building projects, with free grain, with spectacular entertainments. And Trajan is the absolute epitome of this. So if people think of uh, the, the cityscape of Rome in Gladiator, that sense of stupefying, agglomeration of marble and gold it's really trajan who completes the transformation of the center of rome into that cityscape and even hadrian who of course you know is fe- most famous in britain for building his wall this isn't a frontier it's not a barricade it's not a an attempt to keep barbarians out well i suppose to an extent it is but it's 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 a very it's an expression of contempt it's he's not building it because he's afraid that he couldn't keep the barbarians out if he wanted to he is more like the owner of a luxury estate building an electric fence around his estate to keep the riffraff out 
he is basically saying everything within the empire is a gorgeous garden. We are not going to let people in, basically because they are not worthy of being admitted. Hadrian's wall is a marker of contempt for everyone who lies beyond it. And Hadrian can do this because he also is a military man. He's a very proficient soldier. And the beard that he wears, although Greek philosophers wear beards, and so he is making a public statement to Greeks that he is a philhellene, that he is an admirer of Greek culture. At the same time, the beard is what legionaries wear. So he is saying, look, I am one of you. I am a common soldier. Um, so absolutely, being a general, being a soldier is a crucial part of being a good emperor, in the opinion of the Romans. But you talk about that limit of the, the Roman Empire and, you know, best exemplified by the wall, Hadrian's Wall. Is there not really an acceptance that, you know, you can't go on conquering forever? You have to have a limit in order to ensure that the Roman Empire continues? I think there is in the East where there is the one geopolitical entity on the borders of Rome that presents a threat and, and a, a kind of worthy to be called a rival. And this is the empire of the Parthians, who are uh, an Iranian people who have also conquered what we call Iraq, Mesopotamia. And they had inflicted a notorious defeat on Roman arms back in the, the dying days of the Republic. The, the armies of Crassus, one of the triumvirs with Julius Caesar, had been defeated. Mark Antony as well had been defeated by the Parthians. And Augustus had essentially adopted a policy of watchful peace towards the Parthians. Trajan, having conquered Dacia, what is now Romania, he thinks, I want to knock them out. So he invades Iraq. And it all seems to be going terribly well. But then as in recent examples of what seemed to be spectacular conquests being followed by insurgencies and meltdown, Trajan's conquests in the East, they all start to kind of slip away from him. And he dies of a stroke, leaving Hadrian to try and calm the situation down. And the flames of revolt are blazing not just in Mesopotamia, but across Rome's pre-existing eastern provinces. So in Egypt, in Syria, all kinds of places. And there's a serious prospect of absolute meltdown in the east. Hadrian does recall troops from Mesopotamia. And I think that is an acknowledgement that the conquest of Parthia is beyond Roman arms. And one of the ways in which Hadrian is able to disguise this is that he never admits back in Rome what he's done. He grants Trajan a posthumous triumph. He implies that, you know, everything's been hunky-dory. He doesn't major on it. So there's a sense there that he is a bit embarrassed about that. But what he does along the Rhine, where he orders the, the legions to build an enormous barricade beyond the Rhine to keep the Germans out, and of course for us most famously with Hadrian's Wall, the whole point of these is that they're stupefying. Only the greatest power on the face of the planet could possibly construct these enormous monuments. And a bit like in Game of Thrones, the rumour of the wall kind of reaches all the way down into the deep south. So in Rome, I think, the reports of this extraordinary barrier far in the barbarous north reassures people that you know, Rome is a great power and it's a highly aggressive statement. It's not a defensive statement. Pax for the Romans is an aggressive word. It's an active word. It's a, it's a forward-thinking word. And Hadrian's Wall, in that sense, is the embodiment of the idea of Pax. It's about defending everything that lies kind of behind it, while simultaneously saying to the barbarians who lie beyond it, you are not deserving of, of conquest. Well, I'm really glad you brought up the failed attempts at, at Parthia. I was interested in the Roman view of history, which often has a deep psych psychological hold. For example, you know, the defeats against Carthage, or rather it's sort of, you know, defeats seem to have a, this deep psychological hold. And even their legions, you know, their, their heritage is very important to them. So I was interested in, in the Roman view of history and how that kind of... Well, I think the Romans would say that they can, never, they can accept defeat in battle, but never in war. So that's why, you know, Hannibal famously pushes Rome to the limits but Carthage ends up destroyed. Arminius and the Germans wipe out the legions, three legions in the reign of Augustus. The Romans visit terrible devastation on Germany and they feel that honor is thereby satisfied. And shortly before Nero um, kills himself, the Judeans rise in revolt and there is never any question of allowing them to get away with it. Uh, so even though the Roman world collapses into civil war in AD 69, that doesn't in any way mean that the Romans are going to step back. Vespasian calls pause on it because he wants to wait and see what's happening. 
but he, where even when he heads back to Rome to become emperor, he ensures that he leaves his son and enough legions to finish the job. You know, this is the Roman assumption. They cannot tolerate defeat. And I think the exception that proves the rule, which is basically Hadrian drawing a veil over the debacle in Mesopotamia, kind of proves it. You know, he's not drawing attention to it because it is a bit embarrassing. But by and large, the Romans stick to the principle that if if someone inflicts defeat on them, then those people have to be punished for it. And they are punished for it. Right. So now I have a slightly unserious question here. And that is, we've recently seen a, well, we're in the middle, you're a lover of cricket, as am I. We're in the middle of a great Asher series. And I wondered what the Roman view of the Bairstow dismissal would be in <laughs> at Lords, <laughs> and and whether MCC members behave like uh, the audience in the Colosseum. Well, the Colosseum is, I suppose, the closest we have to a great sports venue in Rome, and it's built in this period, precisely in this period, supposedly with the loot from the conquest of Judea. Although I think that that is. An exaggeration i think it's actually it's stung out of out of the, the greeks more generally there are rules that govern how gladiators should fight and those who cheat probably don't survive to tell the tale so bearing in mind that the best incident happened at lords in england uh, foolish i think of the australians had they been playing a roman 11 to, to attempt something like that because i think they would all have been horribly put to death for it and, and i think the mcc members would uh, be entirely in their rights to insist that it be particularly gruesome but you know that that's a marker of how different we are to the romans um yeah. the romans i think would not would not have had the patience for cricket not enough violence right so i have a few questions from um readers and listeners which we can just rattle through which roman emperor would you most like a guest on the rest of this history that's a great question. I think because he is so influential, because he is so hard to pin down, because he was des described by Julian, um, the, the apostate uh, emperor of the 4th century AD, as a chameleon, a man who, who only had to kind of change his circumstances to take on an entirely new colour, it would have to be Augustus, but in the full knowledge that we would probably never be able to pin him down. That was from Richard, by the way. Um, right, so this one's from uh, Catherine. Why BC and AD, not BCE and CE? I, I, I can see what she's doing here. So why not before Christ, BC, or yeah. Anno Domini in the year of our Lord, um, AD? So lots of scholars today are anxious that this reflects an inherent Christian uh, take on the world. And of course, it absolutely does. <laughs> I mean, there's no way around it. It is blatantly a Christian dating system, massively popularized and given to us by a Geordie, the Venerable Bede. So in a way, a, a great British invention, something we should be very proud of. I think that, so the previous book I wrote, Dominion, argues that so many of our uh, assumptions are Christian and we've kind of disguised this from ourselves and that this is leads to all kinds of problems. I think I have exactly the same problem with using BCE and whatever the other one is. What is it? I'm CE. It's the same. Yeah, C E, C. So is it Christian era or common era? I mean, if it's Christian era, then why not just use Anno Domini? I mean, it's you're still saying it's Christian. If it's common era, then isn't that very, very I mean, that seems even worse than saying it's Christian. I mean, you're implying that the Christian era is the common era. It isn't a common era, it's the Christian era. So I think that we should use a dating system that acknowledges our inherent Christian prejudices. You know, there are other dating systems if you want. You, know, you could use the Muslim one if you want, the Muslim calendar, or you could date it from the fall of Rome or whatever. I mean, there are other dating systems available. I think that it is best to be upfront about where our dating system comes from and to try and avoid the, the conceit that has been a feature of the West for basically two centuries since it became kind of globally hegemonic that Christian civilization and global civilization can be elided. So that's why I'm very against it, very opposed to it. I would rather boil my head than use BCE or CE. Good stuff. Right. Now, do we take, James asked, do we take history too seriously? Because I think this is one, one of the successes of, one of the reasons 
of the success of rest is history is that it's it's never i mean often there are subjects that are that are that are serious but it's generally a relaxed view of history and it, that's why it's so enjoyable but do you think we do take history too seriously there are, i mean there are many historians one sees on social media who are hugely sort of serious about things i think this actually relates to previous question which is that one of the things that has really marked my span of life has been the retreat of overt Christian perspectives in public life. When, so when I was a child at school, it wasn't religious education. It was scripture. We would study the Bible. Christianity was what you studied. And so the stock of lessons, of moral lessons, of stories that you got from that was part of the common stock of how people understood moral issues. That's no longer the case. And so therefore, people are reluctant to draw on specifically Christian stories because it might seem a bit offensive to people of other religions or no religions. So therefore, there, there needs to be a, a new supply of moral lessons. I mean, the moral lessons still seem to me absolutely Christian, but they're looking around for other stories that can disguise that fact. And basically, history has has become the the, the stockroom for these kind of stories. And that means that you have to treat it seriously. You know, if you're trying to use history to teach moral lessons, then you can't view it as a kind of very, very dark comedy, which I think in essence it is. You know, a comedy in the sense that Dante used the word comedy, i.e. containing, mul you know, mul scope for multitudes of horrors. and uh, But that ultimately, I don't think that history embodies a sense of moral progress. I don't think that there are right sides of history. I don't think that the arc of history bends towards justice. Uh, I think that all of those are moral presumptions that are culturally contingent. And that therefore, looking for moral lessons from history is itself faintly, darkly comic. You're doomed to disappointment. No one is going to be the moral exemplar that you need them to be. Well, I guess this leads me on to my my final question, actually, which I know you've you've discussed in the past how if we are looking for a period of history that that has echoes today, rather than the Roman world, perhaps the Reformation is is the is is the clearest. And right. So uh, yeah. So I do think. Uh, so I I think that the 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 closest approximation to what we're going through in the west at the moment which seems to me an enormous moral and ethical upheaval it is a kind of remaking a reformation of our moral hinterland is the 1520s um and just as as the reformation of the 1520s was powered by the revolutionary use by luther and others of the printing press so our moral reformation is being powered by the opportunities provided by the internet and I think it will take us time to calibrate and work out exactly what the process is that we've been going through, just as it took people in the 16th century, you know, about 80, 90 years to work out that they had been living through something that could be described as the Reformation. So what subsequent generations will describe what we've been going through as, I don't know, but um, a Reformation of some kind, I think, is certainly what we're living through. Do you think something like the war in Ukraine is like an important marker in in this sort of new world in that we for the last 30 years we in the west haven't really been fighting for democracy and and, and basic tenets like that and this war which is good versus evil an aggressive russian invasion against an independent state allows us to sort of sit back and go this is where we have a clear a clear set of values that we should all adhere to um, I think it has enabled the idea of military prowess to seem heroic in a way that hasn't been the case for a good while and to, to be kind of broadly accepted across the entire political spectrum as such. Whether, I mean, how enduring that impact will be, I don't know, because it's not us who are doing it, doing the fighting. I, I, I think as with so many things, it's too early to tell. But I mean, I think it is interesting. It 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 is... I suppose serving to, I mean, if you, 
the the sense that if you want things you have to defend them you know as i say the uh, the arc of history isn't necessarily bending towards justice that things that you value can go into retreat uh, as well as expand and 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 um be popular across the world i yeah i mean i think that that is interesting but what full impact it will have i think it's too early to tell tom holland it's been fantastic thanks so much for your time and best thanks of luck with much. the book oh thanks so much thank you thank you for having me thanks so much for listening please do share and rate and review if you can Plenty more great history coming up and our film club this month is the double bill of the 1972 Munich Olympics with Kevin MacDonald's documentary One Day in September and then Steven Spielberg's Munich starring Eric Barner and Daniel Craig. Until then, thank you and good night. <laughs>